All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we are gonna be talking about vitamin D and its effect in COVID-19. Before we get started though, please make sure you hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account, as well as all of the articles and all the references that we're gonna be referring to throughout this video. All right, let's get started. All right, Ninja Nerds, so what we're gonna do is, is I'm gonna basically give you guys the take home messages or basically summarize um, all the different kind of of articles that I went through um, basically involving vitamin D and COVID-19. There was a lot of articles that I combed through. Um, I'm gonna have all of those down in the description box if you guys wanna go click them and really kind of dig in through all the, the details of it. But I wanna just kind of give you guys the take home message. So there was eight things that I wanted to talk about and we're gonna really kind of dig into how vitamin D is involved in these processes and a lot of detail over here. We're gonna really get into the immunology, the nitty gritty stuff. First thing that we kind of see with these articles is that whenever there is lower vitamin D levels, it is associated with an increase in mortality, particularly in COVID-19 COVID patients that are hospitalized. That's one big thing. And we're gonna talk about why that is. The second thing that we see is that vitamin D, low levels of it actually are associated with longer days of people being on the vent, mechanically ventilated because of the cardiopulmonary complications associated with COVID-19. The other thing that, which is really interesting is there may be something with this viral clearance. And so we may see lower vitamin D levels associated with higher SARS-CoV-2 positive PCRs related to infectivity in that sense. Here's something I really found that was interesting in one of the articles is that lower vitamin D levels are associated with elevated CRP, fibrinogen, D-dimer levels in COVID-19 patients. These are all things that are those acute phase reactive proteins, massive kind of inflammation cytokine storm. So we'll talk about some relationships with that. The next thing is that we see that low vitamin D levels are associated with a decreased clearance of that SARS-CoV-2 virus. The next is that low vitamin D levels are associated with elderly, African-American race, Hispanic race, and particularly common in obese individuals or metabolic syndrome kind of conditions. Next one is that low vitamin D levels are associated with an increased risk of developing or progressing of CHF, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and hypertension. And then finally, one of the big things is that we don't have a lot of data on like the actual mechanism of how vitamin D is particularly helping in respiratory tract infections with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, but we do see that vitamin D has been shown to be effective against viral respiratory tract infections like RSV, influenza, and rhinovirus. And we'll talk about all those mechanisms. These are the take home messages that we can basically um, ascertain from all of these different uh, articles. Now what I really want to spend most of the time doing is going over how this is theoretically possible. All right, so now what we're gonna do is, in order for us to really understand how vitamin D is we're kind of basically helping us to modulate our immune system and play roles in particularly prevention or maybe even particularly treatment in COVID-19, we have to kind of go through the basics, like the metabolic pathways of vitamin D, build our foundation, and then we'll dig into like the immunomodulation and some of the other cascades that it's involved in. So a big thing to remember is that vitamin D actually can come from you know, exogenous sources, foods that we eat or the actual medication like the capsules or liquid solutions that it comes in. What are some of these actual sources? Just so that you guys know, you can find this in uh, milk, particularly if it's like it could be fortified in milk. It could be in egg yolks, that's another big one. Uh, yogurts, cereals. An interesting one is liver, okay, so liver. And another one is mushrooms, okay? 
So these are just some of the types of things where you can find vitamin D in. Now, if we take vitamin D, whether it actually be through um, an actual like source, like the actual vitamin D capsules, or whether we get it from this type of uh, food source, we're going to intake that, and it's gonna get basically ingested and moved down our GI tract, right? So this green tube here is representing your GI tract. And here is gonna be our cute little vitamin D, ready to try to help our body. Now this vitamin D is actually a fat soluble hormone. That's very important. So in order for it to actually be absorbed, it actually has to be bound with fat and cholesterol into these things called me cells. I don't wanna to get too deep in that, but I just want you to understand that you need fat or some type of cholesterol source in order for the vitamin D to properly be absorbed across the gut tube and into the bloodstream. And here we're gonna represent our vitamin D. Now, vitamin D, when we're actually taking it, it's usually in the form of a particular name. I'm gonna abbreviate it because it's one heck of a name. I'm gonna abbreviate it as cholecalciferol. So usually it's in the form of what's called cholecalciferol. We're gonna abbreviate that as CCF. So if we, in, we actually ingest these substances, we can get vitamin D, need fat in order to absorb it across the GI tract into the bloodstream. The type that we're actually absorbing into the bloodstream is CCF cholecalciferol in this form of vitamin D. Now that's one way that we can get vitamin D. The second way that we can get vitamin D is from the skin. So you know within the skin, we actually store a particular uh, type of cholesterol here called 7, I'm gonna abbreviate this one as well, 7, uh, actually I'll write it, dehydrocholesterol, okay? 7 dehydrocholesterol, and what happens is, if we are exposed to sunlight, what that does is, is it helps to be able to convert that 7 dehydrocholesterol into this cholecalciferol, if you will. So what do you need in order for this process to occur? You need sunlight or UV light, right? Or UV rays, if you will. And what that does is those UV rays hit the skin and help to convert the 7 dehydrocholesterol into what particular molecule again? The cholecalciferol or the vitamin D. Now, big thing to remember here is that this is actually a fat soluble type of hormone. It's actually a steroid hormone. If you look at its structure, it actually resembles that of a steroid because it's derived from cholesterol. In order for things like that to move throughout our bloodstream, it can't just go willy nilly everywhere on its own. It has to be bound to something to move it around. So we have these proteins in our bloodstream called vitamin D binding proteins. And these vitamin D binding proteins help to bind onto the vitamin D, pretty straightforward, and then help it to move to the particular organs that it needs to go to. So again, what are these proteins that we actually have here? We're gonna abbreviate these as well. These are needed to transport the vitamin D. It's called vitamin D binding proteins. Now, we've taken the cholesterol, I mean, we've taken the vitamin D, whether it come through food source or whether it came from the skin from exposure to UV light. We have this cholecalciferol. It's being transported via the vitamin D binding protein. Then what happens is it travels through the bloodstream and goes to a beautiful organ that we all should be very thankful for, and that is that good old liver, okay? What happens is in the liver, there is a particular enzyme that is very integral into vitamin D metabolism. This enzyme is called 25-hydroxylase. And what this enzyme does is it helps to be able to add a hydroxy group onto the 25th carbon of cholecalciferol. So now, if we have that process happen here, we're gonna take the cholecalciferol and we're going to help this enzyme to stimulate it. And this is going to convert the actual cholecalciferol into 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. So we'll put like a little hydroxy group onto that. Now, what is the name of this now? This is called 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. Now, the next thing that has to happen is we gotta take that 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol and send it to another organ. In physiology, we are pretty aware of what happens here. It has to go to the kidney. And you know, in the kidney, in the, what's called the proximal convoluted tubules, there's a particular enzyme there called 1-alpha-hydroxylase. Again, what is it called? 1-alpha-hydroxylase. 
And all this enzyme does is it puts a hydroxyl group, an OH group, on the first carbon of the cholecalciferol. So now if this guy does that, it helps to catalyze this step here. What is this going to look like now? Well, now you're gonna have this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol turn into the active form, which is called 1 comma 25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. And this is the active form of vitamin D. Okay, we'll write that down, active form of vitamin D. This is the form of vitamin D where it exerts a lot of its actual effects, its hormonal effects. One of the things that we do know about this enzyme, I'm sorry, about this actual hormone, is that it has the ability to work on the actual GI tract, particularly in the duodenum. And when it acts in the duodenum, it helps to be able to increase the calcium absorption. And what that does is that increases the calcium levels in the blood. So we're gonna have increased calcium levels in the blood. But this is actually one of the things that we, we commonly know about it, but there's something else about the vitamin D that's very interesting when it comes to the immune system action. So let's take this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. And now we're not gonna just take it to the kidney, we're gonna take it somewhere else. We're gonna take it to our immune system cells. Because guess what our immune system cells can do? These immune system cells can do a couple things. One is they have a particular enzyme. Guess what enzyme they have within them? If we take an immune system cell, let's just say that we pick this as our macrophage. Okay, this is our macrophage, right? One of the white blood cells. It has a particular enzyme here called 1-alpha hydroxylase. <laughs> that should sound familiar, right? And what that 1-alpha hydroxylase can do is do what? It helps to convert the 25-hydroxycholecalciferol into what? Into 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol. So now, this actual macrophage can actually express this molecule, therefore converting the 25-hydroxycholecalciferol into 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, which is the active form of vitamin D. At once, we probably only thought, oh, this is the only way that we can get that activated vitamin D. But our immune system cells can also help with forming active vitamin D. So we understand how we're able to get the active form of vitamin D, right? We could either take it via the absorption, right, from the skin, from the GI tract to the liver, get the 25-hydroxy, go to the kidney, make 1,25-dihydroxy, which is the active form, or take it to our immune system cells. In this case, we're picking macrophages, and they can also help too convert the 25-hydroxy into the active form 1,25-dihydroxy. Now, here's the cool thing. When you take a look at this hormone, it's a steroid hormone. That means that they don't need proteins on the cell membrane for them to bind to and exert their effect. They can pass right through the cell membrane. When they pass through the cell membrane, there's a particular protein located inside of the cell that it loves to bind to. And this is the vitamin D receptor. So inside, that actual vitamin D, we're gonna represent it as a circle now, a little pink circle here. That vitamin D, that 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, the active form is gonna bind onto this little receptor inside of the cell, and this is called a vitamin uh, D receptor protein. So it's gonna have a vitamin D receptor protein. Once it binds to that protein, guess what happens? It gets taken into the nucleus of this macrophage. When it gets taken into the nucleus of this macrophage, it activates particular genes in the actual DNA. That DNA, when it's actually going to be stimulated, particular genes are stimulated, it'll then make mRNA. You know mRNA? And then mRNA will then go to ribosomes. You know what ribosomes help to do with the, the mRNA? Make proteins. So then we're going to make proteins. What is this process here called? We are actually going to do what? You're gonna have gene expression, make mRNA, that is called transcription. Then you're gonna actually translate that into proteins. Now these proteins that are made are very, very interesting. And that's what we gotta talk about. What are some of these proteins that it's actually going to make here? So it's gonna make a couple different proteins. One of those proteins that we really wanna talk about here is going to be what's called catholicidins catholicidins, one heck of a name. But this is a really cool antimicrobial protein. The other one that we're gonna talk about here is called beta 
defensins, called beta defensins. So already we're able to see that vitamin D has the ability to work on our macrophages, increase the proteins synthesis, particularly what types of proteins? Beta defensins and catholicidins. These are antimicrobial proteins. That's what I want you to take away from this. Let's focus on beta defensins first, because it's a shorter action. Catholicidins have one heck of an action. So what beta defensins do is they love to just fist these viruses' cell membrane. Okay, they love to just punch holes into the cell membrane. Now, actually, what we should be very specific here is a virus is not a cell, but it has, in this case, some viruses, especially SARS-CoV-2, it has an envelope. So a viral envelope is basically made up of a phospholipid bilayer. And what happens is, is these beta defensins, they love to come and just poke holes into that actual viral envelope, which is basically a phospholipid bilayer, similar to that of a cell membrane in actual like host cells or bacterial cells. So now once it starts actually kind of punching all these holes, let's actually write that down, that's a funny thing, right? It's called, it's gonna be punching holes in the actual viral envelope. When it's punching these holes into the viral envelope, this basically is going to lead to the destruction of the virus. This will lead to destruction of the virus. So already we're able to see how vitamin D is able to potentially work on viruses. In a simple way, one of them is by increasing the expression of beta defensins, increasing the expression of beta defensins. Now, remember what I told you, there's not a ton of data looking at this mechanism in SARS-CoV-2. But what we do see this, this actual mechanism in, in some of the research, is we see this in RSV, the respiratory syncytial virus. We also see this in the rhino virus. And we see this in the influenza virus. Okay? And so we can, in some way, make an association that vitamin D maybe has the ability to do this via affecting that virus via the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. So that's one way that we're able to get to this process. The next way is actually the more intense but very, very cool way. All right, the next thing here, the catholicidins, right? These are antimicrobial peptides. One of the things that they can do, okay, is they have the ability to act on these viral particles, right? And you know viruses, they have particular proteins that are basically incorporated into like the viral envelope. It can cleave some of these viral proteins. So one of the things, one of the quick, easy, dirty things that it does is it helps to act on viruses and actually helps to cleave, or another kind of term that we like to use, is it undergo, it causes proteolysis Right? In other words, as breaking down the proteins, cleaves or undergoes proteolysis of viral uh, peptides that are basically making up the virus. And by doing that, if you cleave some of these actual viral peptides, guess what you're going to in induce? Destruction of the virus. So one way we can actually do this is by increasing catholicidin expression. Now here's the next thing that catholicidins do, which is even cooler. <laughs> They act on macrophages. You see this here? This is our macrophage. So it's going to come here and it's going to stimulate this macrophage, our immune system cells. So these catholicidins have the ability to activate macrophages so they can stimulate the activity of macrophages. There's something else that they help to do. They act on small capillaries. So let's say that the virus has actually infected some part of the tissue, right? Like let's say it's the respiratory tissue. One of the things that these viruses will do is trigger, you know, this immune response. Let's say the catholicidin response. Catholicidins will actually cause the vessels in that actual vicinity of where the pathogen is to become more permeable. So it's going to increase the vascular permeability. So that's another thing it's going to do. It's going to increase vascular permeability. Why is that important? Because you know what's running through the blood? White blood cells like macrophages. So catholicidins are going to increase the permeability of the vessels where the pathogen is and cause more macrophages to leak out into this area where that pathogen is. And then it's going to activate more of the macrophages. And then it's going to do one more thing. It's going to tell the macrophages where to come. Where is that virus or that pathogen? And this is called chemotaxis.
So it has the ability to induce chemotaxis, increase vascular permeability, and activate more macrophages. Now, when we activate more of these macrophages, here's why this is so interesting. These macrophages start then, release, uh, basically, whenever they're activated, they come and they engulf. What is that called whenever a macrophage takes in particle matter? Phagocytosis. So what's gonna happen is this macrophage is going to undergo phagocytosis. What is this called here? Let's do it in a different color. Make it purdy, right? This is called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis. So it's gonna undergo phagocytosis of this actual virus, viral particle. Okay, once it takes it in, it takes it into what's called a phagosome, combines it with a lysosome, makes a phagolysosome, breaks down that actual virus like a shiatsu, and then does what? Expresses a piece of that viral peptide. In this case, one of the peptides on the virus, and the one big one that we know about is the S peptide in SARS-CoV-2, expresses a piece of that virus on a very particular protein, in this case, this purple protein. What is this purple protein here called? This purple protein here is called an MHC2 molecule. And again, what is that red molecule there? That's indicating an antigen, okay? So this is indicating a antigen. In this case, that's one of the viral peptides, okay? Then, a particular cell is just kind of come run around, running around the area where the pathogen is and all these immune system cells. And it just so happens to click in with this actual MHC2 molecule in the antigen. What is this cell here that comes into this area? This is called a naive T cell. Okay, so it really doesn't know who it is, like most of us, right? And what happens is this naive T cell has to have a particular protein that recognizes the antigen. And that is called a T cell receptor. Then it needs a particular protein to recognize the MHC2 molecule. That is called what? Let's represent it here in pink since we have it in pink. This is called a CD4 molecule. So it's called a CD4 molecule. Once this interaction happens, this naive T cell, depending upon cytokines that are, that are released, has the opportunity or the decision to go two ways. If, it's like giving it options, if, the naive T cell decides to go this way, we need particular cytokines to stimulate it to go in that direction. And if we want it to go this way, we need particular cytokines to push it in this direction. What are the cytokines that push it in this direction, which is what vitamin D actually helps to do, which is very interesting. We need a particular molecule here called interleukin-4. So what happens is if interleukin-4 is present, what it does is, is it stimulates this naive T cell to become a particular type of T cell, very specialized T cell. And we call this a TH2 cell. So it's a T helper type two cell. This T helper type two cell, once it's stimulated by interleukin four to go from naive to T helper two, then guess what it does? It then starts releasing more cytokines that are gonna activate this next cell. What are these cytokines? This is interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. And what these cytokines are gonna do is they're gonna stimulate this next cell here, this purple cell. And this is called a B cell or a B lymphocyte. And what B cells do when they're stimulated by interleukin-4 and 5 is they proliferate and then they convert or differentiate into another type of cell. This is called a plasma cell. And then what happens is this plasma cell, once it's primed by these cytokines, it starts blasting out very important little antibodies. And these antibodies are now primed to bind to the particular antigen that our macrophage phagocytosed. And what is that actual antigen? Well, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we know what it is. It is the S peptide. But again, we're talking about this with other types of viruses, rhinovirus, influenza, RSV. But we can try to make maybe an association with the S-peptide. Now, once these antibodies bind to the S-peptide, what does it do? I guess that's the big question, right? 
it can enhance what's called your complement system. And without getting into tons of detail here, your complement system is basically a part of your innate immune system, and they basically help to put holes and really damage and enhance the immune system reaction to come and destroy more of that virus. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to increase like your phagocytosis process. So you're going to basically have that macrophage come and engulf more of the virus. And the last thing it's going to do is that it helps to neutralize the virus. So in other words, if you had a virus and we actually produced these antibodies, let's say here is the virus and we produced antibodies against it. If I have antibodies bind to every single one of these points here, guess what happens? That has no ability now to bind to the actual host cell and cause damage. In this case, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's the S peptide binding with the ACE2 receptors. If we theoretically produce these antibodies and bind to it, then we can actually inhibit the actual insertion of the virus into the host cells. So that's pretty cool, right? To see how our immune system helps in this process. Here's the other thing though. This pathway is good. That's what I want you to associate it with, if you will. And you know, I know this kind of sounds a little bit crazy, but this is the good pathway. So I want you to kind of just, in a really simple sense, think about this as the good pathway or the uh, anti-inflammatory pathway, if you will. This other pathway is where we run into a lot of issues with potentially SARS-CoV-2. So this pathway is actually gonna be dependent upon two things. One is dependent upon an interleukin that's released, but guess what? This Th2 cell, whenever it goes in this direction, it doesn't want this pathway to occur. So this Th2 cell, this is crazy cool, it releases a particular cytokine. And this cytokine is called interleukin-10. And what interleukin-10 does is it tries to inhibit this pathway to make sure that most of the naive T cells are going the good pathway or the anti-inflammatory pathway. Well, that begs the question, what the heck is this bad pathway, I guess, if you would, or this pro-inflammatory pathway, and why is it bad? And we gotta get back to the question here, how in the heck does vitamin D help with this? We've kind of seen some sense here where it comes from that catholicidins, the beta defensins, and we're gonna talk about the next part. We know that vitamin D is trying to drive the catholicidin production, drive the beta defense in production, but guess what else it's trying to do? It's trying to drive this anti-inflammatory pathway. So what it does is, is I want you to remember here, is insert vitamin D here in your diagram, where it also has the ability to stimulate this pathway, the anti-inflammatory pathway. So it wants to drive it this direction. And if it drives it this direction, what happens then? Via this, Th2-induced interleukin-10, it inhibits or suppresses the pro-inflammatory or bad pathway, if you will. Now that begs the question, what in the heck is this pro-inflammatory pathway? All right, here we go. In order for the naive T cell to go this next direction, we obviously need this interaction here, but we need another cytokine. And this cytokine is called interleukin-12. Interleukin-12. And what interleukin-12 does is it converts the naive T cell from this interaction into another type of T cell. And this T cell here, we're gonna write it here in blue, this is called your Th1 cells, or your T helper type one cells. When it stimulates this process, the T helper one cells start releasing a ton of a particular molecule that's really going to ramp up inflammation. And this molecule that it's releasing is called gamma interferon. Now, what gamma interferon does is it activates macrophages. Now you might be like, oh, well, that's gonna activate macrophages and cause this process to occur. Well, remember, if it activates macrophages, they phagocytose the virus, and it comes down to this pathway, it's gonna drive it this direction. Why am I saying that this is the bad pathway? Here we go. These macrophages, when stimulated by the gamma interferons, they start releasing a ton of cytokines. Cytokines that you guys might remember from our first COVID-19 video that we did, interleukin-1, and tumor necrotic factor, alpha, and interleukin-6, and interleukin-8. And you know what else? 
lots of other small little inflammatory molecules called chemokines. And there's so many of these. I'm just going to put CXCL. That's what they stand for, chemokines. There's tons of these. So we're going to make a lot of these molecules. And if you guys remember, one of the big ones that was pretty much responsible for a lot of the things that we see with the SARS-CoV-2 is which one? Interleukin-6. This is the big one. Now, regardless, these inflammatory cytokines, this is going to produce a massive amount of inflammation. Okay, so I want to remember, we gave it a particular name. What was that called when you had this massive amount of inflammation due to all these cytokines? Cytokine storm. So it's going to cause this massive cytokine storm. And what that's going to do is, it's going to act on a bunch of different organs. And if you guys remember, we said that it kind of induced multi-system organ failure. How did it do that? Do you guys remember? Well, remember, it had the ability to act on the heart. And we said that when it acted on the heart, it did what? It had the ability to induce what particular type of things? It maybe had the ability to induce heart failure or worsen already present heart failure. It had the ability to produce myocardial infarctions, right? So these are some of the things that we saw with respect to the actual kind of the cytokine storm related to the multi-system organ failure. If you remember, we actually kind of talked about what type of molecule that you kind of trend whenever somebody is having this kind of cytokine storm. You're, you're kind of tracking those troponin levels. And that's one of the reasons why. The other thing is it's acting on the lungs, all of these cytokines. And when it's acting on the lungs, what was that doing to the lungs? That was inducing the acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. So that could potentially induce ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Then it was acting on the kidneys. And do you guys remember what it was doing to the kidneys? It was damaging the kidneys and inducing a severe AKI. So it could also cause acute kidney injury. Man, this is kind of starting to make sense, right? All right, what else? Here's where I found it very, very interesting. What particular interleukin did we say again? Interleukin-6 was the big kind of like problematic one. Well, one of the things that we see here is that it also can act on the liver. And you know when these act on the liver, particularly interleukin-6, but even a little bit of interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha, it triggers the production of a lot of different types of acute phase reactant proteins. What were some of the ones that I mentioned over there with vitamin D? CRP? Uh -huh, light bulb should start coming off. Fibrinogen? Ferritin? Right? And there's other different types of molecules over there. You know what uh, the breakdown product of uh, the actual fibrinogen is? You get like the D-dimers too. So that's also another relationship over there. But again, it's producing a lot of these, what we call acute phase reactive proteins. Now the big thing with these is that these also enhance the inflammatory response. And one of the things that we see from one of the articles here, particularly pertaining to CRP specifically, is that CRP, as well as some of these acute phase reactive proteins, would promote a lot of inflammation of our blood vessels. How? The mechanism is pretty in depth, and, and, and it's, it's simply put that CRP binds onto cells, particularly what's called phosphocholine on the cells, our endothelial cells of our blood vessels, and induces a lot of inflammation a lot of reactive oxygen species. But the whole entire end product here is that it starts increasing atherosclerotic plaques, right? So atherosclerosis, endothelial cell dysfunction. And you know what happens whenever you have lots of plaques and endothelial cell dysfunction and a lot of inflammation within the blood vessels? It increases the risk of thrombosis. So with a lot of these, the cytokine storm and the related acute phase reactive proteins, particularly one of the big ones, CRP, what are some of the things that we're seeing with this? We're seeing increased inflammation, but pertaining to the blood vessels, right? So it's increasing inflammation, causing cellular dysfunction, particularly via that phosphocholine molecule that it binds to, and it's increasing thrombotic states, thrombotic states, 
and it's increasing reactive oxygen species. Whenever these prothrombotic states occur, what do we see from this? You can start seeing emboli or thrombus form. Isn't that one of the interesting things about the actual COVID-19 is that we see of this high uh, coagulability or this hypercoagulability seen with this disease may be related to the cytokine storm. So this is one big thing. Now, here's where I gotta add in this next part here. Let's say that someone has a heart failure or a coronary artery disease or they have diabetes or hypertension. What do you think that these plaques and these thrombi are gonna do to those conditions? It's gonna worsen them. And what patients do we see higher fatality rates with COVID-19? Patients with cardiovascular types of comorbidities, like which ones? This is going to increase the risk of worsening so this can particularly worsen what kinds of conditions? CHF, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and what else? Diabetes mellitus. Oh man. So now we have an idea of what, why this pathway is, is so dang bad, right? But here's the cool thing, let's follow this now. Let's come back and see how potentially vitamin D can reduce the risk of worsening CHF, hypertension, CAD, diabetes mellitus, decrease these actual acute phase reactive proteins and potentially decrease thrombotic states and inflammation, and decrease this actual high mortality rate associated with all these complications from multi-system organ failure. Wasn't that what we talked about over there? We're, we're decreasing the time required on the vent? Let's go back and see how the heck it does that. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through this, here's what I want us to do. Let's take, for example, we have decreased vitamin D, kind of follow this process. Then let's come back really quickly and see what happens if we normalize or increase our vitamin D, how it's gonna affect this process. Ready? You have low vitamin D. Low vitamin D will lead to less proteins like beta defensins and less catholicidins. Decreased beta defensins is gonna to lead to what? Decrease fisting those actual viral envelopes, right? That's gonna to lead to decreased destruction of the virus. Also, you're gonna decrease catholicidins. Decreased catholicidins leads to decreased macrophage activation, decreased chemotaxis, decreased movement of the macrophages into that area where the pathogen is. It's also going to decrease the proteolysis or cleavage of the viral peptides, which decreases the destruction of the virus. So now the virus is building up. Next thing, if you have decreased vitamin D, you have decreased Follow this pathway, decreased phagocytosis of the virus. Then, that means that if you have decreased vitamin D, where else does it act? In this anti-inflammatory pathway. If you have less vitamin D trying to stimulate this immune system reaction this direction, which way are you gonna, what happens then? Let's kind of follow this. Decreased vitamin D leads to decreased interleukin-4 converting the naive T cell into the Th2. So we end up decreased Th2 cells. Decreased B cell activation. Decrease plasma cell activation, decrease antibody production, decrease neutralizing of the virus, decrease complement system activation of the virus, and decrease phagocytosis of the virus. Then, on the other th uh, fact, if there's decreased vitamin D, you're having decreased stimulation of this pathway, right? If there's decreased stimulation of this pathway, what else is happening? There's decreased interleukin 10. That means that you're no longer suppressing this pathway. Where are you gonna drive the pathway? in the pro-inflammatory or, how do we define it? Pro-inflammatory or bad, not bad, bad pathway. Now, if you're not suppressing this, this is gonna have more of these T cells turn into Th1 cells. More Th1 cells release, more gamma interferons, more cytokines, more multi-system organ failure, more acute phase reactive proteins, more inflammation, more thrombotic states, and worsening of CHF hypertension, CAD, and diabetes mellitus. It makes sense that we can kind of understand those assumptions that we made. So we talked about the deficiency of vitamin D in this pathway. Now, what if we have increased vitamin D, or normalized vitamin D, or upper limit of normal vitamin D? How does that help it? Increased vitamin D increases expression of the beta defense and, and catholicidins. That means that we're going to increase the destruction of the virus by proteolysis or punching holes in the viral envelope. We're gonna make more catholicidins, more macrophage activity, more phagocytosis, more expression of the actual virus on the MHC2 complex. If there's more vitamin D, which pathway are we gonna to try to stimulate? 
this pathway, the anti-inflammatory pathway, increasing antibody production to neutralize enhanced complement system activity in phagocytosis, as well as increased vitamin D is going to increase the Th2 cell production of interleukin 10, suppressing the bad pathway, decreasing the cytokine storm, decreasing the multi-system organ failure type of effect, decreasing the actual acute phase reactive proteins, decreasing inflammation, thrombotic states, and decreasing the worsening of these comorbid states in COVID-19. <sighs> That's amazing how that actually makes sense, right? We gotta do one last thing that I thought was also really cool going back to this ACE2 angiotensin cascade. So the next thing that you guys got to remember, we kind of talked about this a little bit back in our COVID-19 kind of pathophys video. But if you guys remember your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone kind of cascade, right? The liver produces a particular molecule called angiotensinogen. Tensinogen. Angiotensinogen is a precursor because we know that it actually has to get converted into what's called angiotensin type one. And it's done, that happens via a particular enzyme made by the kidney, which is called renin. So renin helps to stimulate this process. Then angiotensin one is, has to be converted into the next important molecule. And this next important molecule is called angiotensin two. And angiotensin II, in order for that to happen, we need a particular enzyme in the lungs, which is called ACE. Now let's be very careful here because we're gonna kind of type this one as ACE1. Because ACE2 is a different molecule. And that is going to help to stimulate the conversion of angiotensin one into angiotensin two. Now, here's what we know about angiotensin two. We know that high levels of angiotensin two particularly can increase lung injury. How? One of the things that we know is that if uh, angiotensin II levels are high, it binds onto an angiotensin receptor. When it binds onto that angiotensin receptor, it increases vasoconstriction to kind of increase pressure. It actually increases inflammation and it increases like fibrosis and a lot of like remodeling processes. And all of these things basically increase lung injury. Now, what we know that's really cool, vitamin D inhibits renin. So let's kind of little smash in here our little vitamin D Okay, that one comma 25 uh, dihydroxy cholecalciferol, it inhibits renin. Follow along with me then. If you have decreased renin, that means less angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin one. So there's gonna be decreased angiotensin one. Less angiotensin one means that you'll have less angiotensin two. That means less activity acting on the angiotensin receptor. Less vasoconstriction, less inflammation, less fibrosis, less lung injury. How does it get any cooler than that? Guess what, it does. Angiotensin II can move a different pathway. Angiotensin II, has, in order for it to move to this next molecule, okay, it needs a particular enzyme that we are all aware of in this COVID-19 pandemic, and it's ACE2, right? ACE2. It's designed to stimulate this pathway. What does ACE2 stimulate angiotensin II to become? I'd never heard of this molecule until this, but it is called angiotensin 1-7. And what angiotensin 1-7 does is, is it increases your vasodilation effects. That's gonna decrease the pressure, right, in your cardiopulmonary circuits. It's also going to decrease the inflammation it's gonna decrease the remodeling via that fibrosis, and that is going to decrease the lung injury. One of the theories behind this decreased, inter, uh, decreased movement into this pathway is what? SARS-CoV-2, right? What we are assuming here is that SARS-CoV-2, there's an association that whenever you have lots of SARS-CoV-2, right, 
it is doing what to this enzyme? It's decreasing the concentration of this enzyme, right? Because it's binding to it, causing it to get taken in. It's just decreasing the amount of ACE2. So that means less angiotensin II goes to this pathway, more of it goes to this pathway. Guess what vitamin D does? What we're potentially seeing? Vitamin D may actually, and again, when I say may, we need to kind of do a little bit more studies into this, but vitamin D can potentially stimulate and increase the activity of ACE2. If you increase the activity of ACE2, you increase the conversion of angiotensin 2 to where? To angiotensin 1-7. You increase vasodilation, decrease inflammation, decrease fibrosis, and the big bare bones thing here is that you decrease lung injury. So vitamin D has the potential to increase this pathway and decrease this pathway. <sighs> That's amazing. And then the one last thing that I read, just to finish it off as like there, you know, as if there isn't enough that we've covered, is that we've also seen that vitamin D can stabilize. So vitamin D also can stabilize those pulmonary capillaries. So the epithelial cells or the endothelial cells of the pulmonary capillaries, it's been shown to stabilize the cell membranes, okay, of the pulmonary capillary endothelium. And again, that is quite interesting when it comes to this actual disease. We've done a lot so far, but we're almost there. And this is very interesting, what we've been able to kind of see from this. The next thing that we have to talk about is the people that are, like what are the causes of vitamin D deficiency? And let's make sense of that. And what's very, very, very interesting is the people that are more likely to be vitamin D deficient, if you look at the, if you kind of like take and compare, put them right next to each other, those that are vitamin D deficient are usually, when you look at COVID-19, fatality rate in COVID-19, they're almost like identical in kind of vitamin D deficient and severity or higher fatality of COVID-19, kind of the demographics and risk factors and all that stuff. It's really interesting. Pretty much make it simple. What if your liver is failing? So if you have liver failure or like severe, like chronic liver disease, Right, that decreased function of the liver is gonna to lead to decreased vitamin D, kind of like activation, right? So we, we could really say activation because it has to go through that whole kind of hydroxylase pathway. And then from there, we obviously could see what that could potentially do. The other thing, which is pretty, pretty straightforward, is what is another pathway that you have to go through? You have to go through the kidney, right? We said that that was one of the other pathways. So when someone has uh, chronic kidney disease, or some type of renal failure, that also leads to decreased vitamin D kind of activation and decreases the kind of amount of activated vitamin D to carry out those functions. And again, we can see what that would do. Here's the really interesting one, obesity, right? And you're probably like wondering like, what the heck? I was too, until I kind of looked into the mechanism here. With obesity, you have more fat cells, theoretically, right? And what, how do we define obesity? Like you use BMI, right? Greater than 30, which means I'm obese, but, and I am. But the, the whole point here is that whenever there's high obesity, that means higher fat cells. What do we say about vitamin D? It's a fat soluble hormone. Guess where it actually does get stored sometimes? In fat cells. If you have more fat cells, guess what you do to that vitamin D? You sequester it, you suck it in. And if you sequester lots of that vitamin D, how much vitamin D is actually in the blood circulating and available to carry out these functions? Not a lot. And so that can decrease the vitamin D in the kind of the actual, the, the circulating vitamin D. We'll just say in the blood in this case. And we can kind of see how that is effective, right? That's, that's very interesting. The other thing here is with elderly. I didn't know how else to represent them except with someone with a cane, no disrespect, but you know, in elderly, and those that are elderly, they have decreased production of vitamin D from the skin. The elderly is a very, um, uh, pretty straightforward one. And in elderly individuals, 70s, 80s, right? So we could say like 70s, you know, to 80s, their skin, 
has less vitamin D production, right? So they have also just less vitamin D production. And here's the thing, go back to this. What patients do you see um, higher fatality rates in with COVID-19? Elderly. Could it be some association rather than exact correlation? I don't know. But again, you, that's a very interesting thing to look at. Elderly have higher fatality rates, and one of the things here is that they also have low vitamin D production. Again, could just be an association. But the other thing here, which is also pretty interesting, is go back to your skin. Remember, your skin is important for producing vitamin D. So in those individuals who have lots of melanin, right, which actually kind of like decreases your vitamin D production and absorption, that also would lead to decreased vitamin D. What individuals have darker type of melanin? African-American and Hispanic. Okay, it's actually very, very common in general for this population to have low vitamin D because of the high amounts of melanin in the skin. Also, those with decreased sun exposure, you could add that in there as well. If they have decreased sun exposure, uh, with relation to uh, like the 35th parallel when you look at like the map and stuff like that, whenever there's decreased UV exposure or kind of uh, sunlight exposure, that also could potentially decrease that vitamin D production. And again, which population do we see higher fatality rates with COVID-19? African-American and Hispanics. They also have low vitamin D. Is this association? Is it actually kind of a correlation? Again, interesting facts here. And again, the other thing that we know about vitamin D is that whenever there's uh, lower levels, we already kind of wrote this down there, but it's been known for a long time that low vitamin D is associated with higher rates of CHF, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and diabetes mellitus. When you look at the population that is at higher fatality rates with COVID-19, what are those conditions? these conditions. Again, it's pretty interesting. We can't obviously just assume, oh, it's vitamin D, but it's pretty interesting to kind of see some of these kind of relationships here. That covers pretty much everything about that vitamin D pathway, the risk factors and all of that stuff, kind of really tying in everything we talked about with the take home messages of all those articles. All right, so the question is, is that, that I would like to know, and I know that I hope that what you guys would be asking is, what is a low vitamin D, right? It's a level that basically potentially, you know, increase the risk for a lot of these potential possibilities with uh, any viral infection, whether that be SARS-CoV-2 or any respiratory infection. And, and the other thing is, you know what else is really interesting is that vitamin D um, has also been associated with decreasing the risk of colorectal cancer. So again, you just can't go wrong with taking it, you know? And we'll talk about one of the big things is vitamin D toxicity is crazy rare. We'll go over that in a little bit, but again, there's so many more benefits than there is risk to taking vitamin D. And that's one of the big things that I kind of wanted to say on my part when it comes to vitamin D. There, again, there is way more benefit to vitamin D than there is risk associated with it. Okay, especially like toxicity. All right, so the first thing that I wanna talk about is what is a low vitamin D level? Again, there's uh, different units uh, for our UK and engineered fam. I kinda went and tried to find what it was, but generally in the UK, I know that they use nanomoles uh, per liter. So in the UK, it's less than 30 nanomoles per liter, right? Is what we kinda say when you're checking like the serum vitamin D levels. In America, we use nanograms per milliliter. And generally, anything less than 12 nanograms per milliliter in the US is considered to be kind of a low vitamin D level. There is other numbers. Um, and then what they kind of say is the other numbers that I read in one of the articles was they actually said less than 75 and less than 30. But again, this is kind of like the really lower limits. You get below this, you should probably consider taking vitamin D. What is the goal vitamin D level, really? And what we see is that from a lot of these articles is that whenever you try to achieve a, uh, a vitamin D concentration within the blood that is greater than 75 nanomoles per liter, you see a decent benefit from the vitamin D, okay? And then whenever you see levels within the US of greater than 30 nanograms per milliliter, you see that a decent benefit with that when it comes to vitamin D. 
For those of you that are curious, I was looking it up and there is a conversion factor between this. And it's, it's generally, if you take nanograms per milliliter and you multiply that number by two, that's gonna give you the number in the actual nanomoles per liter. In case you were curious, I wanted to kind of learn that as well. So that was interesting. But again, low vitamin D levels are generally somewhere around this. Your goal, to, anything to take away from this is to you know, try to achieve something higher than this amount. That leads, that begs the question then, what dosage should I take to try to keep my vitamin D levels above that range? And there's a lot of different numbers. So the next thing is dosage of vitamin D. What dosage do we need to be taking of vitamin D to get us to around that goal? And before I mention that, because I, I, went, I went into the, um, the endocrine society's kind of recommend, recommendations, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and this kind of answers a little bit of this question is, what if you're taking these large bolus doses, right? So really large bolus doses is versus kind of like the prophylactic like doses. And generally those are like daily or weekly. You know what was interesting? They were get, like in one study they gave like high bolus dosages, like um, 20,000 international units all the way up to like uh, over even over 100,000 international units. And when they compared that to those who were just taking like a, a prophylactic dose daily or weekly, the daily or weekly dose was shown to be more effective and superior than these large bolus doses. So that's really interesting. And so one of the things that we should take away from that is it's better to receive these kind of daily, weekly prophylactic doses than it is to get these large, large boluses, okay? So the next thing is what is this dose? Well, if I, we went kind of off of the endocrine society and what they kind of looked at was generally Okay, if you're an adult, an average is somewhere around 2,000 uh, international units per day. That begs the question though, what's kind of like the upper limit? The, you can go 2,000 international units. Generally, what they say is the upper limit is going kind of around 4,000 international units per day. Some people take higher than that. You know, and that is okay, and I'll explain why it's okay. It's just that some research has shown that it's not super effective. It is a little bit more effective. It does increase those vitamin D levels when you go above 4,000, but it just doesn't do it that much. So it's not super, super effective, but it is still effective if you go above that 4,000 international units per day. The other one is for pediatric patients. So for, for little kids, they say 1,000 international units per day. And that is pretty decent. And then there is a microgram conversion if you guys look that up. Um, there is kind of a, in case you, you look at your, your medicine, you're like, whoa, this is like micrograms. There is kind of microgram conversions between international units and micrograms. But generally, this is kind of that like recommended dosage is 2,000 international units for adults. You can go up to 4,000, but there's just not a lot more tons of benefit beyond 4,000. All right, so before we move on to the toxicity of vitamin D, there's one other thing that I wanna mention. Because we talked about these dosages that are recommended by the Endocrine Society, they added one other thing for fatties like me. So <laughs> obesity, right? When you're taking vitamin D, and people who are obese, they obviously sequester more of that vitamin D. So guess what you have to do? The dosage that they actually kind of set out for obese patients, okay, so for obesity, you have to take that recommended daily allowance dose and multiply it by uh, 1.5 for overweight, but for obese, greater than 30 BMI, you have to multiply it by three. And that will give you the actual dose that you should be taking to keep those vitamin D levels closer to goal, okay? The last thing that I wanna mention here, because this is obviously should be a question, with anything that you take, is there adverse effects or risks or anything that come with it? And believe it or not, according to the Endocrine Society, toxicity of vitamin D is very, very rare. You would have to get levels greater than, so normal goal is greater than 30 nanograms or greater than 75 nanomoles per liter. You'd have to get greater than 150 nanograms per ml of vitamin D plus you'd also have to have hypercalcemia to really see some of the uh, toxic effects of vitamin D. And to even add on to this fact that obviously this is a very high level when you look at it in comparison to greater than 30 and greater than 150. Okay, well let's take the person that would say, okay, what if I take lots 
and lots of vitamin D, I could potentially get to that level. There was a study in 2018, um, and what they did is they gave, I think it was like 20,000 international units per day to like a patient group. And whenever they checked that over time, they checked the serum levels of vitamin D, at that, at, that, at that amount of prophylactic dose, the actual level of vitamin D was only around 60 nanograms per ml. And they were taking large dosages, where generally we're only gonna be, you know, maybe up to 4,000 if you wanna go a little bit higher. So that just kinda of shows you that there's a really, really slim chance of having vitamin D toxicity. But, let me add on one last thing that could potentially increase the risk of vitamin, toxic, uh, vitamin D toxicity. And this is in patients particularly who have sarcoidosis. You know in sarcoidosis or other granulomatous diseases, but this is the big one, they produce lots of vitamin D. And if you take large doses of vitamin D and your body, because of this disease, is producing large amounts of vitamin D, there is a potentially higher chance to reach beyond that level and start experiencing the toxic effects. But with all of this kind of said and seeing the benefits of this and the very little minimal risks, the benefit of taking vitamin D extremely outweighs the risk of any toxic effects of vitamin D, especially and particularly prevention of COVID-19. All right, engineers, so this covers everything that we need to know about vitamin D and COVID-19. Again, if you guys wanna dig through all of these kind of studies, again, I'm gonna have all those uh, links in the description box so you guys can go check out those studies and what I've talked about here in this video. But I hope it made sense, I hope it helped, and I hope it answered your questions about the effect of vitamin D and COVID-19. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.